Welcome back to the Book Wanderers Club. I'm Anna James. I'm the author of the Pages and Co series and thank you for joining me for another episode. I hope you've been enjoying these episodes of the Book Wanderers Club uh, and meeting some authors, hearing about how they write their books and tell their stories. I am back today with another three authors to tell you all about their books and the worlds that they've created. First up we have Elle McNichol. Now Elle's debut, A Kind of Spark, has in fact just won the Blue Peter Book Award, so congratulations Elle. Uh, but she joined me to talk about her brand new book, Show Us Who You Are, uh, which is set in the near future. So Elle talked to me a little bit about the inspiration for the story, what it's like uh, writing a story uh, about a neurodivergent main character and why that's so important. So here is Book Chat with Elle McNichol. So welcome to the Book Wanderers Club, Elle. I am so happy to have you here. Thank you uh, for coming and chatting via Zoom about your new book, uh, Show Us Who You Are, out now. Uh, and um, so we're going to have a chat about your book and your writing. Uh, Elle's going to give us a little taste and a little writing prompt at the end. So to kick off, um, could you give us a bit of an introduction to the new book? Okay. So it's so much harder to talk about than my last book, I kind of <laughs> but Show Us Who You Are is set in a futuristic London, um, no COVID in sight, and it's about a young girl called Cora, and she meets this boy called Adrian, and they become super fast friends, like best friends immediately, and they sort of need each other, and his father runs a company called Pomegranate, and they use technology and artificial intelligence to make holograms of real people so holograms that sit and stand and talk and act exactly like humans and they use it for people to meet celebrities and also for people to talk to their family members who are no longer alive Cora thinks it's incredible Adrian thinks it's horrible and there's something deep and dark going on at pomegranate that they're about to find out so. I mean that was uh, that was pretty slick <laughs> <laughs> I mean I hope but yeah <laughs> there's not much I can say but yeah it's like Black Mirror meets Stepford Wives, middle grade, yeah, hopefully. And we're not going to do any spoilers, so don't worry if you haven't yeah. had, if you've just got your copy, you haven't had a chance to read it, we won't go into detail about the twists and turns. Um, can you pinpoint the sort of seed of the idea? Like, was it Cora? Was it Pomegranate? Like, one of the themes? What? Where did it kind of grow from? I think, so I started writing it in lockdown last year. And there was nowhere to go, and I'm um, and, and I had COVID, and I was locked in a room. Um, you know, no one was coming within a hundred feet of me, and I just was talking to virtual people all the time, um, as we are now. You know, lovely virtual people, and I thought, wow, what if this was the future? And what if there was like a kind of, I thought about like a digital Madame Tussauds, like because whenever you go to Madame Tussauds, it's not very good. And <laughs> dummies always look a bit kind of a bit odd but it's still fun um uh, but I thought what if it was like digital and like they could really like come to life and you could talk to people who you would never meet people who had passed on or people who were famous and I just thought that's you know and then I knew that in our world people would charge money for that and it would be a company it would be a corporation uh, so it kind of came from there and and then it came the the heart of the book is the relationship between the two kids they're really good friends it's kind of a a real a big kind of love letter to friendships um so that came from my friends and from yeah from my um yeah my, my friends I really want to write my friendship so it's kind of those two things mm -hmm. and you mentioned of course that you wrote it in lockdown and a kind of spark your debut obviously you didn't write in lockdown you talked about how it kind of impacted the story but I'm interested I'm always interested in how other writers like write kind of the more physical sense of it like how did it kind of change in terms of your process and where and how you kind of wrote it or d did it um I I don't know if it did um I the thing about lockdown for me is my life didn't change that much because I'm a bit of a recluse. So um, I was writing a lot more at night and um, I just, I think with Spark, I was writing something quite cheerful and hopeful and, and small and about a community. And with show, I just wanted to write something really imaginative and really, um, really, I don't even just wanted to write something very different. But um, yeah, in terms of did writing change, the process change? I don't think so. I think it kind of, stayed the same that's a really boring answer so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, I was a recluse before and I'm still a recluse now so <laughs> it didn't change a lot 
Because I've had to, I've started listening to, do you know on YouTube you can get like ambient soundscapes? So I write, I like writing in public, like in coffee shops. So I use now like fake coffee shop noise to try okay. and keep myself. Well, that's really interesting because I talk to myself. So I've never been allowed to write in public because I would, I would unnerve people with the way that, that my process, I talk to myself and I talk like I'm two different people in the story. So I've never written publicly for that reason. I don't want to be um arrested so I I I write at home all the time I think that's why my process didn't change that's really interesting actually um, yeah, I've become landscapes they're like I use they're like cafe ones just for like general ambiance try and convince myself I'm writing in a cafe but I also use like I found this one that's like what's it called it's called like magical academic library or something and it's like pages turning and rain and if I'm writing kind of like a magical library scene I put it on to get me like in the vibes <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> um, you talked about how it's set in uh, the future, but it's like a pretty near future. And I thought that was a really interesting set because often books are either kind of super sci fi or contemporary. And it's a really interesting window. Why, like, as an author, what did that kind of near future allow you to do differently? Well, in, in some ways, um, no spoilers, but the ending is quite hopeful. So I wrote about a future that I hope that we'll be living in. Um, that was definitely present when I was, you know, writing in lockdown, I was writing a future I hope we'll all see. And um, yeah, I don't think things will change. You know, it's probably about 20 or 30 years in the future. And I don't, there's a few things peppered in to do with the environment and more sort of climate awareness. But I always love these films and books that are written, you know, 30 years ago, where they think in the year 2000, we're all going to be living in like a big dome mm -hmm. and like and like <laughs> going to like, you know, the moon um, on a weekend. Um, and I, I just didn't want the book to date in that way. <laughs> I didn't want it to be uh, these these wild sort of prediction. It is sci fi, but it's not, you know, it's not alien um, uh, Star Trek sci fi. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> sorry if I've just lost some customers there. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I wanted it to be a future that that people could go. Oh yeah, I think that's where we'll be in in a couple of decades. Um, and just before we do have a little reading, I would love to just hear a little bit more about Cora, kind of as a character, who she is, and how you found her voice. So I'm a neurodivergent author. I'm an autistic author, and um, a kind of spark is you know quite famously an autistic book now I think most people know um but I was very keen to I care a lot about disabled characters in, in kids fiction and I think that they all have to be very different so I was keen to just show that yes Addy is wonderful and a kind of spark but that's one way to be autistic and Cora is another and Cora is very guarded and very um sort of closed off to a lot of people. She's kind of the opposite of Addie who kind of wants to be everybody's friend. Cora is much more um, introverted and very, has a big, big wall up and much more like I was when I was 11. Um, I just, I remember so vividly being that age and being very sort of protective and, and, and you know, having gone through bullying, having gone through, you know, the horrors of, you know, <laughs> late junior school where um, friendship groups are all changing. You know, I just, remember that feeling and so she's she's introverted and and closed off and the book sort of allows her to open up a little bit and um and, and love herself a bit more uh again no spoiler I just can't talk about so much of this book but but yeah she's very different to Addie and I was very keen to be like hey thank you for picking up my first book and learning about autistic people but please remember they're all so different and here's another way to be mm -hmm. And again, no spoilers, but of course, that's one of the things that Cora is grappling with. There are people in the book who kind of want her to be representative of all autistic people. Yeah. A lot of what she is grappling with is that assumption from other people. Very much so. And I think that was probably, it's funny, isn't it? You'll know this as well. Once you finished a book and once it's out, you start recognizing um, in, the, in it, you're like, oh, that's what I was going through. I think I found it quite hard with Spark when people kept expecting me to be um, the microphone, to be the person that knew everything about, you know, everybody that was like me. And that's n never something I've said I, I can do. And it's quite, quite a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. And I, I can't. <laughs> 
but <laughs> she yeah she you're exactly right she does go through that and um and a lot of those scenes are from what it feels like to be diagnosed and what that process is like and it's very um you know it really puts a microscope on you and um but yeah, and you guys will have to read it to find out what we're talking about. But you read it and then you'll be like, oh, that's what that they're makes sense. Do. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's also important what you say about that pressure to be like a spokesperson. And it's the importance of, it's why I like own voices and all that is important because, you know, it's so easy to fall into the trap of you have like one book representing one community and that exactly. author is suddenly forced to be the spokesperson for that community. Whereas if you just have like a broad and diverse range of all yeah. stories, each book can just stand on its own it doesn't have to be speaking for a whole community exactly right yeah I mean yeah there was a time when barely any women were published and the ones that were were really held up as sort of and nobody wants I'm, I'm very very you know sure that nobody wants to be a spokesperson for for anyone else it's a very strange way to be but um but yeah people fall into that habit and I I just wanted to write another book that was like hey completely different perspective mm -hmm. um everyone's so different even if they're in a little community or a group mm -hmm. um, and that's an important I think we never want to be a token and I've been called a token and I don't like it and it's not you know it's not a fun thing to be called um so yeah let's just and but you know my next book is going to be an ND heroine as well so I'm just going to keep doing it so <laughs> Um, right, I think that would be um, a nice moment to get a little taste of the book. So Elle's going to give us a quick reading so you can uh, hear a bit more about uh, Cora and her story. Okay, so this is from chapter two and it's when Cora is talking to her brother who works at Pomegranate and she's first learning about the Pomegranate Institute. What does Pomegranate do? I ask Gregor the question. Dad glances at me nervously. It's not easy to explain, Gregor says carefully, laying his newspaper down with an air of great importance. They use artificial intelligence to provide a service. Like robots? N no, not like robots, more like holograms. Gregor, Dad's voice is a warning. What are they holograms of? I ask Gregor, ignoring Dad. Well, they're of people, Gregor says, the real people. I frown in confusion. I don't understand. When it's fully up and running, Gregor scoots his chair a little closer to me and gives me his full attention. It will be open to the paying public. They can pay money to spend time with holograms. But why would they do that? Well, because some of them will be doubles of famous people. They can pay money and have a long conversation with their favorite actor or musician. Like they're really meeting the person. But how will that be like meeting the real thing? Well, that's where the golden department comes in. They take great pains to make sure every grab, hologram that is, will be as human-like and true to life as possible. They'll study the subject they're recreating and they won't activate it until it's identical. It's people's brains and souls uploaded onto a computer and then projected. Gregor is so proud to work for Pomegranate. I can tell he's thrilled that I'm finally asking questions. I look at dad who is glaring into his mug of coffee. It sounds interesting, I say. Well, that's just part of it. The real work of it will be enough dad snaps getting to his feet and clearing his place at the table you've told her about the place let's talk about something else what's the real work i demand i hate when they keep things from me gregor is so much older than me he's 26 and i'm just 12 so they've always outnumbered me with their infuriating grown-upness well we interview real people and study them so we can make a gram of them and then they can live forever virtually like virtual immortality and their loved ones can visit them after they've died i stare at gregor processing what he's just said. So I feel all of the things I want to say jumbled up inside of me. So if mum had been interviewed and studied by this place, they could have made a copy of her to live forever? Dad makes a sound I can't name and storms out of the room, but Gregor smiles. Exactly, Cora. The idea is so strange it frightens me a little. Speaking of pomegranate, there's something I actually wanted to talk to you about, Gregor says, glancing at the door to the hall as if he expects Dad to come charging back in. What? Well, Magnus, you know the guy whose house we were at last night? Adrian's dad. Yes. He's really interested in interviewing for you for the Golden Department. I flinch. What? Why? So that's my <laughs> little intro to Pomegranate. Amazing. Um, so as the title suggests, uh, the book kind of explores and raises some pretty big questions about who we are and what we stand for and obviously the characters are kind of grappling with this but of course as a reader you, you're thinking about the same thing as well um I would love to know kind of what would you what would you like readers to take 
from it in terms of the questions that you're asking? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I think, so it has multiple meanings for me. I think one is to proudly show who you are. So to be proud of yourself and, um, you know, all parts of yourself and, and, and don't hide things. Cause when you hide parts of yourself, I hit, you know, I, hid being autistic for a very long time and it wasn't very healthy I didn't feel good so it's good to be open about who you are and show the world but I also think it's important um so there's a quote from a very famous lady called Dr Maya Angelou who says when people show you who they are believe them and it's about not listening so much to what people are saying people might be saying all the right things but actually looking at what people do and I think that's something that's so important for all young people, for anyone, is to be, you know, like, well, this person says this, but their behavior says this. You know, somebody might not be saying mean things to you, but if they make you feel a certain way in their actions, it's important to examine that. So, and again, we can't spoil the book, but um, Cora learns that some people maybe aren't, um, aren't who they are presenting to be, that their actions don't match up with their image. And um, so it's, it's a little bit of that as well. So it's self-acceptance, but also looking at what people do and not what, what they say. Mm -hmm. um, and both your books are published by Knights Of. Yeah. Um, so I was hoping you could tell us just a little bit, because some of the kind of young readers and writers watching might not have come across them. Um, could you tell us a little bit about kind of what they stand for and uh, what, why you have been working with them? So Knights of, um, that's their name because, you know, Knights of the Round Table, that's what it's from. Um, and their whole ethos as a publisher is that they want to publish books about characters that are underrepresented. So characters that are black or Asian or um, gay or disabled, um, you know, all these different identities that are somewhat um, underrepresented and are marginalized, they want to, you know, showcase and proudly publish. Um, and a lot of their authors are also um, underrepresented in the industry too. So um, they noticed that there was not a lot of um, characters from underrepresented backgrounds in kids lit. So they made a company that was going to publish those kind of books. And some of you might know High Rise Mystery by Sharna Jackson. That's one of their big, great titles um, to young black detectives. and. Yeah, they just are slowly plugging away at changing the industry a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this is an annoying question, but um, can you tell us anything about what you're working on next? No, <laughs> I will say that, um, you know, it's, it's Anna knows this as well. It's a lot of work when a book is coming out and um, my publishers, you know, the publishers always get a bit quiet before your book comes out and then they got in touch to say, hey, we can't wait for book three. Can you send it to us by May? And I was like, <laughs> okay <laughs> and, and so that's all I can say I think it will be coming out um next year okay exciting okay well you but you are writing something else that's yes. the key <laughs> for me um and just before we finish off with a writing prompt um Elle has been also making YouTube videos during lockdown Elle's been doing a writing a kind of lockdown writing workshop uh, and I will leave the link to her YouTube channel where you can find all those videos in the description um so but could you kind of tell us a bit about what writers will find if they go and watch your videos and why you wanted to start it up so I wanted to start it up because this was back in January when January was hard when everybody was like, okay, we're going back to home learning. We're going back to um, a big serious lockdown here in the UK. And I just thought, um, what if I can do something twice a week that is a little bit of something creative that can maybe spark a little, you know, I set exercises at the end of each little session, which is not homework, nobody has to do them. But um, I, I said, you know, if you want to send me the work, that's fine. So I've been looking at people's work and we've been talking. It's been really lovely. It's been like a writing workshop. Um, and, you know, some teachers have been using it for their English lessons. And it's just, yeah, it's just something I just wanted to do something useful because I just felt quite useless in January and thought, gosh, this is, you know, I've got to do something kind of proactive and they're really good fun and they're just uh what can you expect they're they're breakdowns of how to get that first draft going because it's really really easy to think of an exciting idea sometimes not always but it's hard to get it on paper so they're just my kind of tips for how to do character and plot and setting and dialogue and then also um sometimes battling that anxiety that comes along with being creative Amazing. And as I say, there'll be a link down below to Elle's YouTube channel where you can find 
all of the videos. So to finish off, um, Elle has got a writing prompt for you. And as always, if you do uh, any writing inspired by any of the prompts by the authors, I would love to see it. There's an email address in the description box. Um, the book, uh, oh, I'm gonna get it wrong now. No, the book wonders club at gmail.com. Uh, so do send any writing you do to me. I'd love to see it. So over to you, Elle. So I thought because pomegranate was about famous people maybe coming to life and meeting historical people. Um, I would like you to write about your character waking up one morning, coming downstairs and finding a famous person from history sitting at the kitchen table. It could be Charles Dickens, it could be Jane Austen, it could be anybody you want. And it's just what conversations will your character have with them? It's a little bit like Pomegranate, it's a little bit like Pages and Co as well with, you know, famous. I say, that's such a, I love that. That's a good <laughs> point between our books. Um, who can you off the top of your head who who would you pick or who would you be fascinated from history to talk to I I would love to meet Charles Dickens just to be like were you writing about this person when you made this character because I feel like you were it would just be gossip um, <laughs> or, or um Alan Turing I would really love to uh, yeah so. I think I would pick um, Anne Boleyn. She's my Amazing. favorite historical figure. I'm fascinated by her. So imagine all six of them around the table. Would Can be you imagine? <laughs> that would be, yeah, the dream, the historical dream. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much, Elle, for coming on the Book Runners Club, telling us about uh, your new book, Show Us Who You Are. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. So next up for our big questions segment, we have Struan Murray. Now Struan is the author of the Orphans of the Tide series. This is my copy, but this is approved, so it's not quite the right, uh, the, nor the finished cover, so I'll put one of those there. And here you can see the cover of Shipwreck Island, which is his new book, the sequel, uh, which is out now. So Struan talked uh, a bit about world building and creating uh, the world of his beautiful fantasy stories. And then he answered uh, some of your big questions. As I say in the video, these questions are from two schools. They're from Farfield Primary and from Two Mile Hill Primary. So thank you so much to them for sending their questions in. So here you go, here's Struan Murray answering your big questions. So welcome to the Book Wonders Club, Struan. Thank you so much for coming uh, to chat about your books. Uh, so the series, uh, Orphans of the Tide is the first book and the series title. Um, and the second book, Shipwreck Island, has just come out recently. Um, so to start with, um, could you give us a bit of an introduction to Orphans of the Tide, your, your series and your world? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Orphans of the Tide is a, uh, a fantasy story all about this um, ancient, mysterious city um, that is kind of mostly submerged beneath the sea. Um, and one day when the tide goes out, uh, a whale is found on a church rooftop. Um, and basically when, when whales die on land, something that happens, which I didn't discover until I started researching my book, is they actually sort of swell up and then eventually explode. Um, and so the main character of the story, who's called Ellie, and she is an inventor, um, she knows that the way to stop whales exploding is to cut them open. Um, but, uh, but when she goes to cut, cut, cut the whale open, a hand reaches out from inside and grabs her. Um, and this sets in motion all sorts of events because basically the people in the city think that this, the boy that she pulls out of the whale is um, possessed by this evil god called the enemy. Um, and so Ellie doesn't think he is. And so she, uh, her and her best friend, who is this uh, red-headed girl called Anna. In That's fact. obviously my yeah. favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they have to basically fight to uh, keep him safe from the Inquisition so they don't hunt him down. Um, and then in the second book, which is called Shipwreck Island, which came out last Thursday, um, he, um, they, our heroes um, escape to this new, they've escaped the city and they travel to this um, strange um, new uh, kind of tropical island um, ruled over by this very mysterious queen and um, they kind of get embroiled in this big kind of struggle where there's these shadowy people trying to take the queen's power from her and, and Ellie has to help her. Amazing. Um, good job of not giving too much away uh, for the second. Oh, yeah. Hard yeah. of the series, and you wanted to talk about the new one, but you yeah. uh, can't give anything away. Yeah. Um, 
one of the things I loved the most, apart from obviously the ginger character called Anna, who is the best bit about the book, naturally, um, was just the world building. Like the city is such an incredible kind of creation. It's so atmospheric. How did you go about kind of creating creating the city? Do you use like sketches, drawings? Like how, how do you kind of bring it to life in your mind? Yeah, I mean, so it actually started life as I was just kind of, I do a lot of doodling when I'm trying to kind of conceptualize and kind of kind of figure out what the ideas in my head actually are. Um, and I drew this whale on a, on a rooftop, on, on a kind of church rooftop, and that kind of got me thinking about, okay, well, what kind of world could could that happen? Like, what, what, what would actually have to happen for a whale to end up on a rooftop? Um, and so that came, came, gave me this idea of, okay, well, it's a city that's actually mostly underwater um, and I grew up in Edinburgh um, which is in itself a very kind of ancient quite like uh, you know it's full of these very tight narrow alleyways and it actually has like a another city underneath it like there's this buried city under Edinburgh that was basically just kind of built over um, and it's that I found that idea so kind of haunting and, and I and I gave me this idea of a city which kind of just has all these levels to it and some of them are actually underwater um and in it's kind of the feel of the city is very much like like Edinburgh um, I also slightly had when I was reading I don't know if you're a Lord of the Rings fan but you know Minas Tirith the the city like which has kind of like got the layers it's like a submerged Minas Tirith but I'm letting my real Lord of the Rings nerdery <laughs> shine yeah, out here I mean I, def I de definitely came into it as well um and also there's a, there's a place in France called uh, Mont Saint-Michel um mm -hmm. which is another big inspiration because that's that's that literally does actually get kind of covered by the sea yeah um, and when you are not being an author, you are a scientist, mm. um, which is interesting and different from a lot of authors. Um, how do you think kind of your background in science um, affected the way you like wrote your story? Um, I think, I mean, it was, in many ways, it was kind of like a coping mechanism, like, a, like research and science is very unpredictable. Um, you, you never know how things are going to turn out and and you can't help but get very emotionally invested in 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 whether experiments are going to work and whether you're going to you know you're, you're kind of questing for for secrets and you're hoping you're going to find them but more often than not you don't or you find out something different mm -hmm. um and so i just i needed something to do when things weren't quite going the right the way i wanted to them in science and i have still no idea why i picked writing because writing is just like that like writing you know you're, you're, <laughs> in many ways you're this the same kind of like landscape of ups and downs and um but it was just nice to have a little escape when things weren't quite going well in the lab mm -hmm. um and i do think i mean uh, scientists have to be very imaginative and creative i think we, we think people tend to think of scientists as quite kind of kind of cold and calculating but really science is is is, is a very creative kind of pursuit um so I, I I do think there's quite a lot of, of crossover more, more than people realize between the two things and before we move on to some big questions from some readers um this is going to be three books there's gonna be three books in the series um it's kind of difficult to talk about it without spoilers I know you're in the midst of working on it at the moment but can you tell us anything at all about the third book Ooh, okay this is going to be <laughs> a minefield but um it's a big kind of meeting of cultures so in in books one and two we establish these two very different places we have the this this city which is this kind of cold gray um quite grim place to live and then in book two you get this kind of beautiful tropical island which is much happier and livelier and full of life and in the third book those two islands are kind of going to collide in, in in a way okay um okay i feel like you should stop there before you say anything i always feel guilty asking authors <laughs> that because i know that i hate being asked it by other people yeah. but <laughs> that's a good a good uh, little flavor of what what people can expect um right are you ready for some big questions i'm so ready i'm a little nervous but, but. <laughs> We've got a real we've got a real mix this time. So these are a mixture 
of questions from year four at Farfield Primary um, and Eagle and Magpie classes from Two Mile Hill Primary. So thank you to both of those classes and teachers for sending me your questions. So the first question is not, is hopefully I'm easing it in, is from Abigail, who wants to know, how old were you when you started to write your first book? Oh, um, th th this book, Orphans of the Tide, I, I was uh, 27 um, when I started to write it, because it actually took five years to get it published, so it was quite a long uh, process. Uh, when I wrote my first, like, ever novel, um, I was probably like 20, 22, 23. Um, but like, even when I, when I was younger than that, I actually wrote this series of very like, very blood, I think I was 11 and it was this very bloodthirsty series of detective stories about this detective that just, he was definitely like, if he'd be, he'd be in prison if he was a real life detective, like, but, but I, I gave them to my uncle and he, he just found them so funny. Like he just, they were hilarious so I, I kind of kept writing them for him but it probably wasn't good for him to be encouraging this this <laughs> yeah, were really gruesome <laughs> yeah okay well maybe we can look forward to uh yeah I feel like you should yeah. revisit them maybe yeah. post Orphans yeah. of the Tide we're gonna have a bloodthirsty detective series <laughs> um Tyler would like to know what were your top three favorite tv programs when you were growing up which is such a brilliantly specific question. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, okay, Tyler, that is a great question. Okay, I'm gonna say, okay, so TV programs when I was a child. So Pingu, I think, Iconic. was an absolute favorite. I just loved Pingu. I think Pingu's still on today. I think I think people still know who Pingu is, ho hopefully. But he was this. I've only, he's only memed a lot. I've seen a lot of yeah, memes. So he, he was this. He was this penguin, and he, it was kind of claymation. So he was made out of uh, clay, and it was just all these adventures he got to with his sister. And um, when I was seven, I actually I did a drawing of Pingu, and I sent it off to the official Pingu magazine, and they published it. Hey! It was like. <laughs> It was the greatest moment of my uh, professional publishing career. <laughs> will probably remain so. Um, okay, number two, I'm going to say um, uh, there's a TV, a cartoon called Sharky and George. Oh. Wow. Did, did you watch it? No, no. As in, I was I was aware of it, but it wasn't. Okay. Wasn't. Yeah, it was about a, a, a crime fighting duo who were a fish called George and a shark called Sharky, and they lived in this like underwater world and they solve crimes but it just had the most amazing theme tune which I will not embarrass myself <laughs> by having now but it was so great um and then oh gosh um I'd probably say Tintin um because it was a Tintin cartoon and I love Tintin because he was this um ginger guy with who solved crimes and he had a he had a, a Jack Russell called Snowy and I had a white Jack Russell as well oh, growing yeah. up so I felt felt a great affinity with Tintin and he um was very kind of brave and resourceful mm -hmm. great answer yeah, yeah yeah I was thinking when I saw this question I was thinking about mine and I think I would go for Sabrina the Teenage Witch oh, classic um Art Attack which yeah. I just love so much and I've forgotten the third one that I was going to say Oh, the Queen's Nose. Do you remember the Queen's Nose? Ooh, oh. That is not, I feel like this is, um, we're a similar age, but I feel like perhaps Tyler, the, some of these, you won't know what they are, but if you go on and have a look on YouTube, you'll be able to find some uh, some clips. But the Queen's Nose is based on a book. Uh, it's about a magic 50p that you used to grant wishes. And um, it was, and I loved it. In tune, like just on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, it had like a sort of like, um, sort of, spangly like <laughs> the Demon Headmaster that was another favorite of mine. Demon Headmaster terrifying another great one based on a book as well um next question is from Jacob who says this is I don't know this is quite a big this really is a big philosophical question do you enjoy being an author is it exciting oh gosh <laughs> um it's not entirely what I expected um, it's, I mean, there is nothing greater than getting to tell stories, um, especially when people are willing to, you know, support, you know, pay you to write those stories so that you can, you have the time and the freedom to, 
to to just go away and dream up worlds and 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 I couldn't be happier about that really like that that is just wonderful um it's obviously it can be quite hard like it's a bit like having it's a bit like having a, a school project that lasts the entire year and like and you and and you don't just get to work on it you, you, you know you have to you have to kind of keep giving it to your editor who's kind of like your teacher and they keep giving you feedback and so it, it can be quite um it can be more like a school project than you might expect like there, there's more kind of there's hard work and there's and there's you get you have to you get told things by your editor you might not want to hear and you might have to like change things in your story that you really don't want to change and that can be a little bit can be a little bit tif difficult but um i mean in the end like i get you know i get to write stories and people read them and sometimes people even come back to me and tell me how much they love those stories and really there couldn't be there's not much that's better than that and in terms of it being exciting i do think you probably because of the pandemic i think mm. one of the exciting things about being an author you probably haven't had been able to yeah. do so much of because some of the really lovely bits of getting to travel and you get to go and visit schools in loads of different places and sometimes different countries and I feel like that tends to be the kind of exciting bit of it but at the moment obviously that's not really we none, none of us can do any of that stuff um this is a horrible horrible question uh Josie would like to know would you rather be in a room full of snakes or a room full of spiders oh no <laughs> oh that was who was that from Josie Josie yeah oh Josie that's that's really a one <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna say I think the logical answer here would probably be spiders because I got a feeling that they're probably less likely to actually bite you like if you just leave them alone I think they leave you alone but snakes I think would be a bit more vicious but I'm still gonna go with I'd rather be snakes because spiders like frighten me on like a, a deep level I, I am the same as you I, like for me like I totally see the logic but I would have to choose snakes spiders yeah. are my worst thing <laughs> let's not let's stop talking about this um Josie you've clearly uh <laughs> caused yeah, my still crying, yes. we're all <laughs> right let's move on okay uh next question is from Oscar who would like to know what is your favorite film based on a book oh okay oh that's a good question Oscar um I'm going to say Jurassic Park because I just think it, that I, I, that film had such, it, that film came out when I was far too small to be watching it. But I think I managed to like creep down when when nobody was watching because I must have been like four or five when that came out and 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 they and they had it on VHS and I think I watched it on this like crackly old television, but it just was the most incredible. Because you know, I loved dinosaurs just like most kids. I just loved them, and that film had such a a big effect on me. And I did later read the book, and the book's very really good. Um, but I would never have discovered it without the film. Mm -hmm. um, Great pick. Now we have two questions from Magpie Class, who sent me their questions collated. Um, so the first question from Mag Magpie Class is, "What is your McDonald's order?" Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to go with, I mean, it depends on the time of day, but <laughs> not, not that I visit it that frequently. Um, but uh, I'm going to go with a Big Mac with strawberry milkshake Ooh. And, and a medium fries, which is Ooh. like my one concession towards healthiness that I, that I stop at medium. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. The second, class, the second question from Magpie Class is, do you have a favourite pen to write with? Oh... I, I think f for my own emotional well-being, I can't afford to have a favorite pen because I would lose it. Um, I don't I don't do well with keeping track of my pens. They are just eternally vanishing. I think there is like a black hole in my house that just sucks pens up. Um, so no, I don't I don't have a favorite pen. No, I see the wisdom to that. But maybe one day I'll be kind of good enough at keeping track of them that I'll be able to have a favorite pen that's, that's my author goal yes a favorite pen. A good goal I have a favorite pen I have a fountain pen uh, yeah. but then I don't use it locked because I get nervous about <laughs> breaking it. It. <laughs> you have it there uh yes hang on uh here we go 
it's a a pretty color as well and it like goes like that you screw it off and that's I'm my also, i'm also left-handed so i can't really do the whole fountain pen thing ah uh, okay that makes sense thomas would like to know slightly macabre question if you could bring a celebrity back from the dead who would you choose oh gosh okay thomas okay gosh you're really making me work here um <laughs> I'm gonna say so. Jim Henson. Oh, great! The, the creator of the Muppets. Yeah. Created things like Sesame Street, and um, um, and and like uh, Dark Crystal, which had a big effect on me as a as a as a kid. Um, and I think he's just such a like I I I, I used to read quite a lot about his life because I found him just such an interesting person. Because what kind of person decides okay? my life is going to be all about, you know, making puppets. And then to turn that into like, cause Sesame Street, I used to get up, like, I used to air at like six in the morning when I was a kid. And so I'd get up, you know, bef way before anyone else in my house just to watch Sesame Street. Um, and it had such huge effect on me developing. Like I still say Z instead of Z in <laughs> the American pronunciation because, of, because you know, I learned the alphabet from Sesame Street. Um, and I just, I don't know, he always sounds like such a calm, kind of cool, like, he's not like a lot of celebrities who are very kind of showy and kind of extra. He's very kind of reserved and thoughtful. And um, Sesame Street's had such a big impact on like how, how like, you know, ch children's education, like world, worldwide. So I think he would be really cool to just chat to. Yeah. Um, and then if I can cheat and have yeah. a second person, because <laughs> I've just thought of one as well. Uh, I'd say Ursula Le Guin, I think. Oh, um, yeah. One of my favorite fantasy writers, and who's just like, she's so unique, and her writing and her worlds is so different to all the other kind of fantasy writing out there that I think mm -hmm. I could learn quite a lot from her, and I think she'd just be really fun. Yeah, it's a very savvy choice bringing back people as well who make things that you love, because then yeah. as well as getting to sort of talk, you get to get more books or films from, uh, from yeah. them. Yeah. Um, right. Penultimate questions from Halen, who would like to know who your favourite author is. Oh, gosh. OK. Um, oh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I can't really just default again to Ursula Le Guin, but she's definitely up there. Do you, I mean, I, I guess I should maybe pick one who's who's living and then maybe one who's <laughs> dead. Um, I mean, there's there's so many and much like all these things, it changes on an almost like weekly basis, depending mm -hmm. on like what I what I'm kind of reading at the time I mean I think I think Ursula Le Guin has had such a major effect on my writing um I'd say Philip Pullman because his dark materials so Northern Lights and those books I think I I, I think maybe even have had an even bigger effect on my writing and I think without if I never read those books I might not even be writing and I think if I was writing they would have a they would be something completely different um, and I think as a, as a child reading, it was the first time I felt that a book was just kind of meeting me on my level. Like it didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was being talked down to or patronized, which I think, and children are very receptive, children kind of are very receptive to that. They know when they're being talked down to. And um, I found, yeah, it was the first time I'd read a book where I was really like, wow, okay, this is a book for me and I love it. Um, so okay, so I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Philip Pullman. Yeah, that's Ursula. a great answer. He's up there for me. Um, mm. he's up there for me as a he had a huge those books had a huge impact on me as a person mm. and and as a writer. Right, the last question is actually a bonus question from Mrs. Ooh. Brandon at Farfield because she uh would like to know what are your tips uh, for how to choose a book to read for pleasure. Oh okay. Um. I mean, I think you can go so many different ways. I think, I mean, I often surprise myself by uh, reading things that I would never read in a million years um, and um, discover something completely new in terms of like a, a kind of writing that I never even thought I would enjoy. And I think um, asking friends, asking people around you what they've enjoyed is always a great kind of way in because you immediately have this kind of connection you're like okay this is you know this is my best friend's favorite book so I know that this has meaning to them and I think that can that can really add something to when you are reading a book book of your own um 
Um, I think, you know, asking, asking booksellers is always going to be a great, great thing to do because nobody knows as much about books as they do. Um, and you can always email bookshops for, for, for great recommendations and tell them the things you do like and they might be able to suggest um, something based on, based on that. But so, yeah, so I think you can go, go both ways. You can kind of lean into the things you already like, but then you can also just ask someone for something completely different. Yeah. Um, I put a lot of stock by first pages as well. Like I, mm -hmm. when I'm looking at books and I don't know if, if um, now, well, now uh, the kind of young readers and writers watching now yeah. will be back at school. If you kind of have things that are at the school library and you're trying to kind of sift through, um, you don't even have to read the whole first page, but I'm a big believer in kind of like gut instinct. But if mm -hmm. you like, just read the first sentence, read the first paragraph. And if you know, if it doesn't like appeal to you, don't, like I, I really go a lot on, yeah, gut instinct of, of, mm -hmm. of the first few, first few lines, first page. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I don't think that there's, there's nothing wrong with putting down a book. That, you're not really into it. it doesn't mean the book is bad necessarily. It maybe just means that it's not, the book for you at this moment yeah I think that's good like yeah don't put too much pressure on yourself yeah you can stop reading a book if you don't like it you can come back to it or you don't have to come back to it at all like and don't worry about again what Stuart was saying like if it's not the sort of book you usually read like you know it's also yeah it's okay to just keep reading the same stuff that you know you like it's also okay to just completely try something mm -hmm. out of the blue um, and see how you get on with it yeah. great tips right that is all uh the big questions uh thank you so much for all of your answers thank you to uh the classes who sent their questions in um and shipwreck island uh is out now so thank you so much Drew. thank you so much for having me I've had such a good time now, our third and final author uh, is a slightly different take on the where do you get your ideas from segment because we have a non-fiction author for the first time, which is really exciting. So we have Rashmi Siddhis Pandey, who is an author of picture books, but also brilliant illustrated non-fiction books about all sorts of things for uh, middle grade readers, that's people your age. Um, so her book, Dosh, here, is all about money and finance, how to keep it, how to save it. And that book is illustrated by Adam Hayes. And Rashmi's new book, Good News, is coming out later in the summer, which is all about good things that are happening in the world at the moment, a bit of hope and inspiration. So Rashmi is here to tell you a bit about how she puts together her non-fiction books. Hello everyone, I'm Rashmi and I'm a children's author. Now I write a mix of things, but today I am here as part of the Book Wanderers Club to talk to you about writing non-fiction or factual books. So this is one of mine. This is Dosh, which is illustrated by Adam Hayes, and it's all about money and how to earn it, save it, spend it, grow it, and give it away. Now a lot of work goes into making a book like this one here, but I think there are three main stages. The first stage is the concept stage, where you come up with the idea. The second stage is the researching, writing and rewriting stage. And the third stage is the fact checking stage. So the first stage, concept stage. This is where you figure out what it is that you're going to write about. And what I say to absolutely everyone, no matter whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction, is to write about the things that you love. Write about things that you find interesting, fascinating, weird, exciting, inspiring, because it will show in your writing. And with non-fiction, another thing you might do is to think about what might be useful for other people. So I thought a book about money would be really useful, money and what to do with it, because money is something that we all have to deal with when, you know, at some point in our life, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you end up doing. And I wanted to make a book that would help readers grow up feeling confident, positive about it, and seeing it as a force for good in the world, because I really believe it can be. So I took all of that and I turned it into this book, Dosh. How you might think of an idea like that, something that would be useful to other people. Or maybe you just come up with something that's fun and fascinating. So that can make a fantastic non-fiction book too. Once you have your idea, it is time to plan it out, to map out the book. And my plans are really quite detailed. So they take a bit of research up front so I know what I'm going to put in the book. But that's great because it makes the writing and the researching part a lot easier. So I much prefer to do it that way than to just get started with the writing. Stage two, 
writing, or researching, writing, and rewriting. Now, in reality, what happens to me is I end up doing a lot of researching, writing, researching, writing, researching, writing before I even get to the rewriting. And that's because as I'm writing, new ideas will pop up, or I might need to go back into the research to look more closely at something, check something, or maybe I'm inspired to follow another path and pull something else into the book. So this is really normal, it ends up being a cycle. With the research, I do that in lots of ways. Um, I watch documentaries, I read lots and lots and lots and lots of books around a topic. Um, I'll read all kinds of articles, including very technical academic articles to see what people have been studying the topic all their life are saying. And I'll speak to experts where I can as well. Um, and the thing is, it's not just you know the researching and the writing, there is inevitably a lot of rewriting. And this is true for fiction, as well as fiction, of, as, as well as non-fiction, of course. And that's because, very often, your first draft is not going to be your best draft. It's something that you just have to get down on paper. You know, my first draft of DOSH was a disaster, uh, but I had to get it out of my system so I could have a really good look at it and see how I could make things better. And fortunately, I have a fantastic editor who helps me do that, really pushes me to make the words shine so they're ready to be put into a book like this, illustrated up by someone like Adam. So that's stage two. Stage three is the trickiest stage. It's the fact check. And what I do here is I will triple check, seriously, triple check every single fact inside the book. Um, I will find three sources, I'll put it all in a humongous table so I have a record and I will make sure that everything in the book is accurate. And in fact, with my books, I have a professional fact checker that the publisher gets to look through everything and double check my triple check, if that makes sense. And if it's a really tricky fact, actually, we'll have more than three sources. So there is a lot of work that goes into that process. But it's so important because you, the reader, need to be able to trust factual books, especially in a world where there is so much fake news flying around. So although it's a tricky process, it is an important one. Now at the end of all those three stages, what you will have hopefully is an amazing book. And I should add actually stage four of this process is where you celebrate having that book and celebrate being proud of yourself because that is really important too. Now, if you're thinking of writing some non-fiction, whether it's a whole book or something shorter, my top tip to you is to read really widely to start with, watch all the documentaries, all of that, and then note down the juiciest things that you discover, because that will be the kind of stuff that ends up going into a book. The way I look at it with non-fiction is it's all the stuff that I'm bursting to tell someone, right? Writing nonfiction is just being bursting to tell someone something that's so interesting or so good, so useful that you can't wait to tell them. That is the zone that you should be in when you're writing nonfiction. And you will get to the details of the fact check later, but when you're writing, write freely and really enjoy it because when you do, I promise you that will come across to the reader. So I hope that's helpful, um, and if you decide to experiment with writing some non-fiction, I hope you enjoy it. And to finish off, as usual, we have the reading roundup. This is where I tell you a little bit about all the books that have come out over the last two weeks. As usual, it is in order by the author's surname, so keep an eye out for your favourite. This is a way to give a little bit of a flavour of some of the books that I haven't spoken to the authors about, so you might be able to spot something that you think is right up your street. So first up we have Mort the Meek and the Raven's Revenge by Rachel Delahaye, illustrated by George Ermos. Mort lives on the island of Brutalia where violence is a way of life but he dreams of a peaceful life. This plan goes wrong when the cruel queen appoints him royal executioner. Next up we have City of Rust by Gemma Fowler, an ecologically themed mystery about a girl called Rayleigh who dreams of winning the drone races with her biorobotic gecko Atty. But when a bounty hunter crashes their biggest race yet, they have to flee to the feared Junker clans. Next up is Jamie McFlair vs. The Boy Band Generator by Luke Franks and Sean Thorne, illustrated by David Ortu. Jamie's favourite band's gig goes horribly wrong thanks to Barry Big Time, a music big shot and all-around nasty man. With the help of his friends, Jamie sets out to discover Barry's secret, The Boy Band Generator, which is going very wrong. 
Then we've got The Blazing Unicorn by Alice Hemming. When Marie stumbles across a magical unicorn in the forest, it grants her wishes, but her father tricks her into giving them to him instead. The Girl with Her Head in the Clouds by Karen McCombie is illustrated by Annalie Bray. In 1904 London, Dolly Shepard volunteers to have an apple shot off her head for a show, which kickstarts her career as a stunt woman and parachutist, and this is inspired by a real woman. Our penultimate book is The Weather Weaver by Tamsin Maury. On a family trip to Shetland, 11-year-old Stella begins to learn the magical craft of weather weaving with the help of an older island woman, Tamar, and Nimbus, a feisty young storm cloud. And our last book is the third book in one of my current favourite series, Starfell. This is Willow Moss and the Vanished Kingdom by Dominique Valente, illustrated by Sarah Warburton. And in this third instalment, Willow is at school alongside her non-magical neighbours, but she soon realises that someone is up to no good and teams up with an elf called Twist to prevent the magic from getting into the wrong hands. So that is all for this episode of the Book Wanderers Club. I hope that you have enjoyed it, found it inspiring, learned some things uh, and enjoyed listening to these authors. Thank you so much to Elle, to Struan and to Rashmi uh, for coming on and talking about their books. As always, I would love to hear from you if you would like to take part in the big questions segment, if you would like to send some of your writing, perhaps inspired by Elle's writing prompt. Uh, my email address for this is thebookwanderersclub at gmail.com. If you want to find out more about the books uh, from the authors that I've spoken to today, you can find more information in the link in the description box. I will be back in two weeks time with three more authors and until then, happy book wandering.